Okay, well, good morning. Um, this is the talk about the Color Hug um, Open Hardware Colorimeter. Um, my name is uh, Richard Hughes. I work for Red Hat in the desktop group. This is kind of like a side project. This is like a weekend project. It's got kind of out of control. Um, I've been in open source now for about ten, 10 years, over 10 years. I've done bits of package kit, uh, UPower, ColorD, lots, lots of other color crazy stuff, um, and lots of GNOME stuff as well. So I guess in the last year we've really been working on like, the infrastructure. So we've now got this great stack that we can use for doing all these cool stuff. So we've got the Color D stuff, we've got the integration with the session, we've got KDE tools, GNOME tools, and we've got some kind of nice user interactions. We can say to people, this is a nice, easy to use tool to manage color on your computer. So the next obvious question when someone said, what do I do next? is I say, give money to these companies to make a calibration, to get, to get a calibration device. To calibrate your screen, you need to be able to calibrate it uh, so that you're actually sure you're seeing the colors correctly. So it seems such a shame that we had this massive, really complicated stack that works in software, but actually with hardware, we're still giving loads of money to these kind of people that aren't so nice to open source software. So I'll be saying to people for years and years, go and buy a Huey, it's only $100, and it works pretty well. And then someone said to me, they're like, well, Huey doesn't look that complicated. How difficult would it be to make a Huey? So I sort of scratched my head and I kind of thought, well, I don't know. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer by trade. So I cracked one open, uh, had a look inside. It's three photodiodes, three filters, and a little tiny microprocessor. So this isn't that hard. This isn't $100 worth of, worth of uh, 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 product. So then I sort of did some research on the internet, came across this thing called Colorimeter HCFR, which is a French project to design an open source colorimeter. And I said, I basically want some more information about the source code and can I hack it, can I make it do other stuff? And the more I started asking, the less answers I actually liked. To get the source code, you had to email someone on a forum to get the client code, which was for Windows. Um, and then to get the PIC code wasn't available. It was only available as a binary blob, which you could flash to a certain type of PIC. And I thought, actually, we can do quite a lot better than this. So I kind of figured that a lot of this stuff's going to be patented, a lot of this stuff's going to have some pretty horrific hardware patents, software patents. And so I thought it'd be safer if I went right back to base principles. If I go back to stuff that was designed in the sort of 50s, 60s, 70s, then it's going to be in the public domain. So if you actually go back and do some research, you can find out that using a, a three phytodiodes to create a tristimulus colorimeter has been known for sort of decades. It's not exactly a novel step. So I figured that I'd be kind of safe from stepping on any sort of proprietary sort of patent code type stuff. <coughs> so then I started prototyping. This is a very simple sensor. Um, it's only $2. Uh, and it provides, uh, it, actually the transparent square is about four millimeters by five millimeters. Um, and the sensor itself is about a millimeter by a millimeter. The sensor itself is made up of 16 by 16 pixels, so each sensor is kind of like 20 uh, micrometers in size. It's kind of small. Uh, and this was one of the biggest color sensors that I could buy. Uh, this is, isn't tricky to solder. Um, a lot of the other color sensors that I looked at were kind of BGA type devices, which couldn't be soldered by kind of sane normal people without x-ray machines. So I mounted this uh, little sensor on a, just a break, I bought a Soic 8 Dip 8 board, and then tried to make a uh, like an add-on card for a, a PIC um, development kit that I already owned. And that kind of looked like this. And this just sat on top of the development board and let me basically play with the sensor and say, is this going to work? Am I able to convert the random um, uh, tristimulus of the um, of the sensor into something that's going to produce a fairly good profile. And the conclusion I came to is that, yeah, it could. It, with this $2 sensor, we could use some software and make it quite a lot better. So then, prototype to PCB. Now, I'm used to using kind of proprietary tools. I used to work for a defense company. And so I learned GDA, um, the free um, PCB um, schematic and uh, PCB layout tool. And I did that in about a week. It's really, really simple. It's so much easier than proprietary stuff like Mentor Graphics. Uh, and this is just the board. You can see on, in the, on, the, on the board now, there's the left-hand side of the CPU. The bottom is the programming pins. Bottom right, uh, LEDs. Right-hand side is clock stuff. Top right, um, power. Top, the um, uh, USB ports. And the left is like buffering and stuff. 
and on the back of the board I put the sensor. That was quite a conscious decision because I didn't want the light from the LEDs to pollute the sensor and give misleading results. So I populated it, made one giant mistake, forgot the little red wire is the uh, making the USB bus work, so it's kind of like prototype hardware. Uh, also ignore the soldering, this was done late at night on a, on a Friday night in great excitement. Uh, so there's no solder resist, there's no, uh, there's no identification, but it worked. So I sort of packaged it up. And I, originally I wanted it to be in a clear box. The idea being is that it's an open source project. It's completely open. We don't want to hide what's inside the box. It wants to be completely, uh, completely open and transparent. But it turns out transparent boxes and light sensors don't really go well together because the uh, light was being channeled around by the perspex and was actually creating a, a reading of what light you have in the room rather than what light was on the computer. So I discovered quite quickly that although transparent looked great from a design point of view, it probably had to be a black box. So then I looked at the colour sensor in more detail. Now this is the, um, the response of the colour sensor for different frequencies. Now just for reference, infrared starts about 650. So you can see that it, the device has a really nice response for blue and green, but as soon as it starts getting warm, it starts picking up heat as colour. Now this is an inherent uh, characteristic of a lot of photodiodes and it's okay as long as you're using on a nice cool monitor without significant parts of infrared but I didn't, wasn't sure how much of an issue this would really be. So I looked at the emission spectra. This is from a CRT uh, old, old style monitor. CRT is like four LCDs for all you people younger than me. Um, you see that has a nice blue um, spectra, a nice green spectra, but the red's kind of all over the place. And there is a significant amount of heat at 700 nanometers. And this would really confuse the sensor. Um, and I thought, that's something we really have to do something about this. So then I was talking to an optics friend of mine, and he said, well, why don't you just use an IR cutoff filter, which is something like this. It's a, a filter that cuts out anything much past 650 nanometers. So I looked into this and you can get, uh, for photography, you can get this kind of lens quite cheaply. They're about $25 for a five centimeter disc. But I didn't want to make a product that had a five centimeter aperture. I wanted something that had a very small aperture um, and have the, kind of, this kind of spectral response. So I did loads of research, spent a few weeks talking to different suppliers. And the only place that could supply me a, a custom filter was some random factory in China that wanted a massive minimum order quantity. So I went for it. Um, got something like this. Now they worked out quite expensive. Each one's 0.9mm uh, thick and 5mm wide uh, and has the spectral response you saw on the previous page. Buying them in hundreds is really expensive. If you buy them in thousands they get a bit cheaper but they really want to deal with millions. It's kind of unusual for me to ask for this, this view. And this was the classic example of all the way through the colour hug I'd want to make 50 or 100 of something and suppliers would say our minimum order quantity is 40,000. So this is kind of a recurring theme so with the sensor and the filter together, actually I got three quite nice RGB peaks. Um, with also the black peaks, actually the white, which is like a clear pixel, which we don't actually use in Color Hug, but you can access from the API if you want to do more like a, a, like a, a neutral luminance reading or something. So you can see the problem's kind of solved. So then I thought, okay, this product really works. Now in my office at home, I've got this massive whiteboard, kind of the size of this kind of big green board. And I thought, well, we need to make the first Jiffy bag. The first Jiffy bag was kind of like the first customer who had a functioning, fully functional supported device. So this device, this, this diagram kind of grew from what you see here, to totally covering the whiteboard. And then as the days went past, I kind of wiped things off as they got done. So all things like CE compliance checking, we registration, tax, VAT, uh, all the different kind of software that we needed to get into distros before we could release the hardware. There's no point giving someone hardware that they couldn't use. Um, and also work, and basically to tell people uh, how much of a development device this is, does it work, what other corrections do we have to do in the future. So this became a massive, super complicated diagram that very quickly resulted in this. The more legal advice that I took, and the more kind of, I went to talk to solicitors, I talked to lawyers in the States, and they basically said, beware. You're going against companies that are huge, Pantone and X-Rite, very powerful legal teams, and they will go after you if you get too successful. So I took that to heart and said, okay, what's the plan? Um, they said, well, if you incorporate a, limited, a, a, a private limited company, that means if they sue you, they don't take your house, your car, and your wife, 
they take the profit for the business, which at the moment is kind of negative numbers, that's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's my wife, that. Um, so, very quickly, so if you see references to Husky Limited, it's not because I'm going to be trying to be some huge corporation and that kind of thing. It's really just kind of like self preservation. Um, but this, so then we started producing the device, and I put very quickly went to the community and said, look, these are my ideas. Help me out with the design here. I have no, I've got no, I'm not an artist, I don't pretend to know anything about design. Um, and so I was saying to people, which feet do you prefer? Do you prefer the circular feet, the square feet? Are the square feet too big? What, do you like the aperture in the center? Is the aperture too small? All this kind of stuff. Um, and we kind of iterated the design to kind of involve triangular feet, which, okay, looks kind of cool. It means it's less, uh, there's less material there. And it also means I can buy two pads for one device rather than four, which is a little bit cheaper. Um, then it came to kind of branding. Now, I've talked to some of the guys on GNOME Design, and they've been really good on doing like logos and stuff. Now, my logo sucked, properly sucked. And the guys took the logo that I did and made it look kind of cool. Then it came an issue of how to brand the color hug itself. And the color hug itself is kind of like an ABS box. It's only, it's only a little tiny box, kind of that kind of size. Um, I needed to stick a label to an ABS box. Now, anyone who's ever tried sticking labels to an ABS box tells you they'll fall off within six weeks. So the labels that I've, I found, these are the same labels that if you go and buy a, bo a, a, a bottle of ketchup, this is exactly the same type of label that you'll find in the bottle of ketchup. It won't come off. Um, so these were printed. Now, the minimum order quantity for labels was 1,000. Now, initially, I wasn't sure whether I was going to make 50 of these or five of these. And so it's kind of a big gamble to say, OK, well, this thing, to make it look professional, means I've got to spend a bit of cash. So all the time I'm sort of spending my own sort of pocket money on this project, hoping that it goes somewhere. And this is kind of the finished color hug. Um, you can see on the bottom hand, right hand side, there's a uh, transparent um, light guide. Because it's not actually a light guide, because light guides cost about 55p per light guide. So it's actually a transparent screw that's screwed in from the back. So all these, all the way through the color hug, I've tried to find ways, instead of using a 55p light guide, I can use a four pence transparent screw. Um, and I'm trying to find all these different ways to keep the cost down to something reasonable. For me, the biggest problem in cost is that because I'm making such a small quantity, it costs me almost the going rate um, as, you, as you might go into a shop to buy something. If you're Panton and you're making 20,000 of these at a time, your unit cost can be a quarter of what the same thing I would, I would, um, would, I would pay for. So, yeah, it's kind of tricky. So then I thought, okay, well, I've made one prototype. Prototype works. I'm quite happy with the design. Um, now I have to scale it up. Now, I decided that I wanted to go for a, a double layer PCB to a custom, uh, from a custom uh, design, which fits nicely in the new box, hence the new shape. But bought my boards from China for the cheapest price possible which in hindsight was a massive mistake because four or five percent of the boards had like hairs on the, on the boards themselves and when a hair is made of copper and it goes across the, uh, the, the pick on board, it kind of screws up everything. So in hindsight, I shouldn't have bought the cheapest boards and in the next batches after 150, I bought the boards from the UK and haven't had a single failure, um, with the, but then obviously at a higher price. Um, so this is me getting ready to soldering them all. This is the 50 uh, pick chips as they come on a plate. Now, it's quite daunting looking at kind of all these pick chips, knowing you have to individually solder each one, probably with that microscope. And being completely honest, I quite enjoyed doing the first five. I haven't soldered in a long time. I used to do it as a job. And I quite enjoyed the first five. The next 10 kind of got a bit more tedious. Um, the next 30 was kind of not cool. Uh, and by the last, the last five were done more with anger than any kind of passion. Um, so I sort of, sort of worked out that for the sake of my marriage and my sanity, I really needed to get someone to build these for me. Uh, now, one of the cool things I did quite quickly was uh, just design like a bootloader and a firmware for the chips, so that we always had a way of recovering the boards, even if you use a brick tip. But to be able to put the bootloader on the chip before it was soldered, I had to kind of bodge together a well, a color hug case and a zip socket, um, um, and that went out to an ICSP programming port. This let me program the, uh, uh, sorry, solder the, the picks after they'd been programmed, which meant I could put a self-check program on the pick itself. So if everything was, if say for instance, I'd left out a sensor or a capacitor or the clock, the board would tell me, so it couldn't be sold, it couldn't be sent out without all the components present. This kind of saved my bacon a couple of times after doing things late at night in holidays and stuff. 
So this is the 50 waiting to go. Um, so you can see the, the lids are all there, the bases are all there, the different heat pads, etc., are all there. And it all then became a bit of an assembly routine. This is where my wife kind of cottoned on that this wasn't going to be a small Saturday project and it started to get a lot bigger. So another conscious decision I made quite quickly was that I didn't want to sell a driver CD or some sort of like all these instructions to compile software. When people get a device in the post, they want to just play with it straight away. And I was developing software that was kind of needed all the stuff from like Git Master. It was kind of bleeding edge. So I was asking a lot of people to do pretty random commands and stuff. So I decided to do a live CD. Now this is just a Fedora 16 live CD with a few packages added, pretty stock packages. Um, and it lets the user grab the color hug, stick the disk in, create a display profile very, very quickly without having to muck about with their own computer. Of course, they can muck about, they can install the packages on their own computer. But what was happening quite a lot, people were running some Debian Gen 2 FreeBSD hybrid and then said, the color hug doesn't work. And I said, well, are you sure it's not your system? Have you tried the, co have you tried the live CD? They try the live CD. Oh, the, li the color hug works with the live CD. Well, therefore, it's, it's a problem with your system. It's not a problem with the device itself. And it's quite a good sanity check to be able to say to people, it's not my fault to fix your system. Um, it also means I can get a send out new, uh, I can also um, post uh, on an FTP site new live CDs with all the latest versions of everything, like the Argyle CMS, the new LCMS, all the, all the new releases I can do very easily as like a, 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 a big blob. Now, burning CDs individually on the laptop wasn't popular with me. It was even less popular when my wife was doing it. So we decided we'd get a seven CD duplicator. And this meant instead of having, uh, maybe managing to do sort of 20 CD copies a night, trying to just sitting there in the drive, waiting, ting out the next one, we could just stick seven in, and within 10 minutes, we had sort of like seven copies. And this meant that we could scale up production. So all the time that I'm doing this, I'm trying to work out ways to make things faster and faster and faster because of the amount of time it was taking to build each one. So this is us. Uh, this is uh, Boxing Day uh, last year, uh, day after Christmas. Um, so this is not actually my pajamas, this is my wife's legs. Um, she's sticking on labels and uh, assembling boxes, screwing in screws. And I've been sitting there for about six hours soldering. And this was just my solder station, so static mats, uh, low, vol uh, low voltage soldering iron, heat, uh, smoke extractor, etc. Um, and yeah, so this was kind of how we spent uh, quite a lot of our Christmas holiday. I guess some people think that's slightly crazy. What a lot of people don't work out is that if someone said to me, I want you to make 500 color hugs, to actually buy the parts for that and to gear it up, you need kind of 60, 70,000 euro which is the kind of money I didn't have. So I thought, if I start the business really slow, make 50, and then if they sell and people like them, and this in, it kind of grows from there, and maybe I can make 100, and then use the profit from 50 to pay for 100. Then if they like people like that, and it's still going well, I use the profit from 100 to make 200. Um, and this was the idea to grow the business organically, rather than going to the bank and saying, can I have a loan? Because almost certainly the answer would have been no. Incidentally, I did ask the bank about loans and things, and they said, well, what kind of protection have you got on your code? I said, none at all, it's all open source. Now at that point, I think the, uh, the decision I think was sort of crystallized in, in the bank manager's head, and the answer I think from that point onwards was no. So this is the first Jiffy bag, this is the first Jiffy bag on its way to Graham, uh, Argyle CMS Graham in Australia. So in, in the bag there's the little baggie with the uh, colour hug in, there's a USB cable, the live CD, an invoice, and the, Jiffy and the Jiffy bag. Except the Jiffy bag's way more complicated than that. Actually, if you start like doing 50 or something, the Jiffy bag has a returns label, it has a customs label, it has an address label. Uh, so you've got all these different extra things you didn't actually think of, all these hidden costs, this sort of like... Um, difficult little tiny things you actually need to think about when you make a lot of something. But it was quite exciting to send the first one. But after doing one or two, drilling the holes individually, using a Dremel and a little micrometer, it's not that much fun. And so I decided I needed a quicker way of doing it. So I just made some, started to make some wooden jigs, just some, like, some really basic jigs to I could just rattle a Dremel around and it would cut the perfect holes in the perfect places. And this worked really well for about 150, but with any template, if you keep using it over and over again, the hole just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So I needed something a bit more professional, a bit more, sort of, more, a bit quicker. This was taking, initially doing each one by hand and with a micrometer was taking about 10 minutes per box, which is uncool. This was taking maybe two minutes per box. 
which is fine when you do 50, but not fine when you do 400. So I designed and got manufactured a custom punch. Now, this is kind of the way they do it um, if you're doing like volume manufacturing. So I got, got some random metal guy to make me this punch and die from the States for a couple hundred dollars. And this let me slot it into a sort of, this all looks a bit Heath Robinson and a bit sort of crazy, but it kind of works, trust me. Um, it slots into a, a, like a punch where you just squeeze the handles and it punches the hole in exactly the right shape and exactly the right place. Uh, and so far this punch has done about 350 of these. So it's kind of money well spent. Now, the next step was not being able to solve them myself, but getting someone to solve them for me. Now, this is kind of expensive. I talked to places in Croatia, Hungary, um, Budapest, etc. And all the answers came back to me saying, well, look, we'll do them for you, but we'll do 40,000 minimum. That was their minimum order quantity. If on a special order, they could do 10,000. And I was like, I, I, I kind of want like two orders of magnitude less than that. Uh, and nowhere could sort of find, nowhere, I couldn't find a supplier that would do a small amount at a time. So then I stumbled upon this place in Crawley, just outside London. And they said, yeah, we'll do it for you. We'll have to charge you a setup fee initially, which is quite significant. But then after that, the unit cost is quite low. And this meant that I basically rock up on Monday morning, drop off 200 components of all the different things, 200 PCBs, and then Wednesday morning I just pick up all the finished PCBs. It was like it was fantastic, and I think they worked out about about two or three uh, uh, pounds per board initially. So it, was, it wasn't an expensive process considering it was taking me sort of like sort of 15 minutes per board to do manually. Now, the fabricator said, right, great, I like your PCB, it's fine, there's no real problems for fabrication, but it's taking us quite a lot of time to actually calibrate the machine for each one. The machine actually has to find out like a, like a reference point on the board every single time we put a new PCB in. So this is when you, you, you turn them into, like a, they call it a panel. Uh, so there's a dozen boards on this panel, and it basically means the machine can find the, the, the point, the, sort of the top left um, dot on the board once, and then it can pick all the components and place them in the right places and solve them. And this reduced the unit cost because there was less, you, the, the bloke at the fabricator didn't actually have to recalibrate and unscrew things every single board, actually made it a lot, a lot quicker. Um, also instantly reduced the price of the PCBs. Um, no idea why. Now, the software itself, I realized that we, I couldn't produce a device that was completely working, totally 100% features, and do it straight away. Because people find bugs. Now, when people find bugs in software, it's no problem, because you can just say, yeah, a new, new tab will release. But if I find a bug in the hardware, I can't say, yeah, find a bug in the hardware, grab your soldering iron, some small wire, and a microscope, because people just couldn't and wouldn't do that. So the device itself is deliberately super, super easy. It's like, it's the, the device is, like the simplest circuit I think you can make with a PIC microcontroller. And all the logic's in the firmware. So the firmware itself, I want it to be updatable. Now, as soon as you have updatable firmware, you have people who have power cuts in the middle of the update process, or people that decide it's a good idea to unplug it halfway through. And then you have a, a dead device, a so-called brick. Um, and I didn't really want to have people sending their devices back to me after a couple of years and saying, it's bricked, fix it. Um, so I designed the, uh, the memory map into two sections, one with a bootloader, which is a full USB stack, and it, you can communicate with the device straight away, and one with firmware, with all the stuff that's got, also, it's got, got a duplicate copy of the USB stack, but it's also got all the extra stuff, for all the color sensor interface, and all the, the special maths and stuff. So this means to update the firmware, which normally runs by default, you boot into the bootloader, the bootloader can then update the firmware, and then only if the firmware kind of confirms itself working will the bootloader auto-launch next time. So in theory, it's kind of impossible to break a color hug. That's not, that's not a challenge, um, <laughs> but in theory, it's, it's kind of difficult unless you sort of look at the code. Um, and it, it, this is the, now at the moment, the firmware itself is very simple. It's deliberately uh, doing this things the simplest way, the slowest way possible. So it is slow, essentially. It's, just, it's probably slower than a Huey. But we're not using, we're only using maybe 10% of what the PIC can do. So we, we can use like all the, all the new uh, um, uh, high, high interrupt timers, all the high precision timers in the, in the PIC. So we can make the device a lot quicker. So you can say to people, this, up, this is a firmware update available. If you update this firmware update, then things get magically quicker. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of cool for, for a lot of existing people. This also means I could sell the devices and promise people that, yeah, don't, you don't have to 
wait until it's perfect because I'll send out firmware updates to make it more perfect or rather less unperfect. So each color hug, um, I'm kind of fairly annually retentive when it comes to testing. So each color hug gets tested for about 25 minutes, constantly measuring color samples just to make sure there's no loose connections and everything's doing the correct thing. It also gets calibrated, each individual one's calibrated against a, a reference. Um, and this is just like, I think it's 12 um, uh, color hugs on the spider board, as my wife calls it. Um, basically going through their calibration steps and they're all, they're all flashing, their lights are flashing, they're, they're doing all kind of crazy stuff. But this means that I can send out color hug, kind of sure that it's going to work for the user. Well, fairly sure. Then I started looking at software. Now, initially I developed a program called what is Blibix at Color Hug, um, and this lets you set really low-level stuff on the device. Really stuff that probably this command probably only useful for maybe three people on the planet. Setting things like pre-scales, post-scales, all the kind of the low-level stuff. But it also lets you do quite high-level things, because. The color hug's got a nice, um, excuse me, a, a, a nice, um, powerful pick, but we can do a lot of the color maths on the device itself. So this means if you write a client code uh, library to say get an XYZ reading from the pick, you only have to set, write, or write one command saying give me the XYZ reading for this setting, and then you get a response back. You don't actually have to do any like. Uh, client side maths and all the kind of crazy stuff you have to do in our guard CMS actually to get a reading from a sensor. Um, so yes, it's kind of all on the device and it makes the firmware, it makes the client code super, super easy. Then I wanted to work towards doing GUIs. Now to do GUIs you need to do asynchronous commands to the device. You don't really want to have GUIs blocking and this kind of thing. So I developed this is a pro program that no longer exists. It's colorhug dash GUI, I think it was called. And it basically shows uh, like a screen of all the details about the color hug, calibration, uh, matrice, the pre-scale, the post-scale, and just a general, can it read red, can it read, read green, can it read, read blue. And just toggle the lights on and off. Not particularly useful to the end user, but it was like a quick sanity check that I could do the asynchronous stuff um, using, um, well, I, yeah, I actually use GUSB, which is another thing I maintain, which uses lib. USB uh, 1 to uh, communicate the hardware. Yeah, geeky. But obviously users don't want to look at some crazy, crazy dialogue. They want to look at something simple that they can use. So I went uh, to the guys in GNOME Design, uh, Lapo for instance, was a great guy, and said, look, how should the user update this firmware? I want it to be like a, a really easy process rather than sort of random commands and boot, DOS boot disks, all the crazy stuff you've got to do when you do a computer BIOS. They gave me a load of wireframes and I just implemented them. So I can just grab the version of the device, check it for updates, it's available. I get a, like a, a list of things that's fixed with the firmware since, since the version is installed, like any enhancements, any warnings, that kind of thing. It'll automatically download the updates from the right server. Uh, so it's not hard coded, it's all in G settings, so you can change it to whatever you want. It writes the new firmware, verifies it, and it kind of works. People have been using this for a long, long time, and apart from a few people that have had bugs where they've like removed the USB cable halfway through or had a power cut, i.e. trying to find out what would happen if they did that, um, it works fine. So if the firmware flash, uh, firmware flash fails, it just starts up in the bootloader and goes into like a safe mode with the, the lights flashing, red and green, red and green, red and green, and that lets you recover. Um, to the normal settings. So yeah, it kind of works. I guess then it comes on to the more interesting bits. This is the, my cash flow for Husky Limited, i.e. the Color Hub project. And you can see initially there's a, kind of a, a bit of a dip on prototyping and playing with things, buying bits here and there. And then the first real, can, I, can, I, can you see that up there? Yes, yeah, so the first real dip is me buying all the parts for 50. So you can see I spent there about I guess just over a thousand pounds, which is a significant amount of money when you haven't got a lot of money. Um, and then I, I continued and then I sold the first 50. I made a tiny, tiny profit. Um, and then spent all that profit and more money buying the stock for 100. Except this graph's kind of misleading because all the time that I'm buying 100 or, or 50 or something, I'm, I might be buying a bigger quantity because it's cheaper. So although it looks like I'm making a horrific loss each time, I'm buying bigger and bigger quantities ready for the bigger batches. 
So this is the buying uh, stock for uh, third batch. Uh, sorry, uh, selling, uh, selling the second batch, buying the stock for the third batch. And now we're at the point where we've just bought all the stock. Uh, sorry, we've sold the, the third batch, now we're buying all the stock for the big batch. Now that line since Britain's presentation has dipped right back below zero. But that means that the next one that goes up with the batch of 400 goes even higher. So that's kind of, you can kind of see that the trend is positive, but it's still kind of scary numbers when you look at the, the, the debit card at the end of the month. I guess one thing to note at this point is open hardware is not a great way of getting rich quick. All through this process, I haven't paid myself any money, I haven't paid my wife any money or my parents when they've been helping. Um, so it's not a great way of making a quick buck off the open source community. Um, there is, it is a labour of love, but I think in a year's time it will pay for itself. It will let me pay myself a wage, which is kind of what I was aiming for. I didn't want to be working for free, because um, I, I can't afford to work for free. Um, and I didn't also want it to take over all my time as well. So this is kind of numbers I've kind of pulled out of my, well, made up. Um, this is essentially what I think it cost me to make 150 devices. So you can see a massive chunk is physically buying components for the hardware, like things like the PCB, the sensors, etc. Corporation tax, I would be paying if I wasn't using the profit to buy bigger batches for the next run. Similarly, labour would also be profit, or I say, you pay yourself for labour. That's we didn't take that. We just kind of pulled that forward into, into, uh, into actually bigger batches. Accessories was a much bigger chunk than I imagined it would be. Things like the USB cables and things, which really worked out quite expensive. Uh, stationary things like ink cartridges and things. Things that you don't really, when you're working out how much does it cost to make a device, you don't actually sort of add all this extra stuff in. And then a massive chunk was legal fees, legal fees and accountancy fees, which was kind of important for a project where you've got competitors that are multi-mega million pound, uh, multi-million pound uh, mega corporations. And then discounting. Initially, there was a 20% discount for the devices, um, just basically saying to people, look, the devices probably aren't very good yet, but with the firmware updates, they will be. And also wastage, a significant number of components were wasted, for instance, like the boards that were from China had loads of manufacturing errors, so I wasted loads of money populating them with components, then finding them that didn't work. Um, so actually we wasted a fair bit of cash there. But now the situation is more like this, where the hardware cost has gone massively down because we're buying things in much bigger quantities. Corporation tax is a bigger chunk because we're making more, inverted commas, quote, uh, inverted quotes, profit, even though we're using the profit to grow the batch size each time. Um, that's now become an issue. Now that's not based on profit, that's based on turnover. So as soon as you turn over, so I don't know how much it is in, in, in Austria, but it's, in the UK it's about £70,000 in turnover. And when you've got a business that's not, not making much profit, but you've got high turnover, VAT kicks in quite quickly. That's 20% in the UK. It's a massive chunk I kind of had to find. Labour is similar to last time because we're producing more devices, we're getting faster at making them, um, and so the labour is kind of equivalent for the same, the same thing. Accessories, similar cost, and can't really do anything much about that. Stationary cost has gone down marginally. Um, professional fees, I'm not having to use the solicitors and the lawyers anymore, I just use the accountant. Discounting is much smaller, I only give discounts for bulk discounts now rather than having a standard 20% developer discount. And waste to just hit almost zero. Now we've got the design that works, we know what we're buying, we're not buying the wrong things, and we're not wasting sort of cash and parts. So what's next? Next is, this is our front room, which is currently full of boxes. Uh, no joke, a quarter of our front room is now the Colour Hug office. Um, so there's uh, 400 Jiffy bags waiting, 400 USB cables, 400 different pots with different things, 100 PCBs. It's all kind of, it's now ramping up to the bigger batch size and it's quite exciting as you sort of every day trundle down to the post office with 40, 50 packets and it's, it's quite exciting to sort of get, get through it. This is the Cull Hug Lids, but in, in literally when I get back from LGM I will have uh, two or three days sitting down clicking in PCBs into the cases. Um, so hopefully the backlog that's built up from people who've been ordering these things, I've let I've had no stock, I can hopefully clear the backlog that well, as, as soon as I get back from LGM. So I guess that's basically all I wanted to say about Color Hug. Um, I guess the major thing to take from this is that it, open hardware is 
hard work. It is a labor of love, but I think it's ultimately worthwhile so that we can say to people, we've got this software stack. We've now got a device that uses the hardware stack, the software stack. It'd be really great if other people could do other hard, open hardware stuff that's maybe simpler or more complicated to integrate and say, okay, we now have an open source solution, not a, just an open source stack that requires proprietary blobs. Um, I guess that's all I wanted to say, so thank you very much for listening, and I guess any questions? Thank you. No worries. Right. I guess from the colour hug itself, we've got to work on speed. Speed's a ma major issue. At the moment I said I've got a, it's like a bit banging type frequency counter. It's literally super basic. So I guess the next thing is uh, work on the firmware to be faster, start working on the accuracy, because we've got some issues with like math, math rounding and uh, different integer precision issues. So different things we can easily fix in, so in software. For me personally, I can only do one thing at a time, so I'm going to concentrate on getting this batch of 400 out, and then I can concentrate more on the firmware and the clients also again. Um, as regards to other projects, I'd love to do another project, but my wife's kind of said, well look, can I get my front room back first? Um, she's got like a, a, a no boxes clause now. Um, so I'd love to do something like a photospectrometer or something, so you could do um, sort of measurement of paper. That's an order of magnitude more expensive and more complicated. Uh, so that would need BGAs, X-ray, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's maybe not this year, but maybe next couple of years. I'll think about it. Does that answer the question? Cool. Yeah, I'm using a uh, S um, Dream Color successor R S R G V which is fine for a lot of monitors, but bad. So I've also, uh, one thing I've neglected to say was uh, there's also a Color Hug CCMX loader, which lets you load on up to 64 uh, color, uh, correction matrices for specific displays. So if you're running like a, I don't know, Adobe RGB emulation, you'd use the Adobe RGB CCMX correction matrix, which will convert the RGBX, uh, XYZ primaries to the correct things. So you can actually use that. If you've got a common laptop, people have started to contribute their. Um, I'll show you this on my laptop. But, um, people have started to contribute their CCMX matrices for their screens. If you've got like a ThinkPad, you can use the ThinkPad CCMX matrix, and that makes the results a lot more, well, a lot more accurate. Um, Sure. Um, well, this is the reason I wanted to spend so much time on the um, CCMX program. The pro pro program itself is just like the flash loader. You sort of plug the color hug in. It brings up a list of um, like uh, of like the, the slots that are used. So you have like a default slot for uh, CRT, default slot for um, uh, cold cathode, etc. Um, and then it connects to the internet, and it will automatically download all the CCMX files that people have contributed back to me. That's one of the conditions when you buy it, it's kind of, if you have a photospectrometer, could you please contribute to CCMX? And then we, as a benefit, we can, the community as a benefit as a whole. So yeah, that is, is the big issue for a source colorimeter. But because we can crowdsource, if, as soon as we have the 800, 400 extra people, we can, we can crowdsource more. So it's kind of chicken and egg. We need, we need the users to contribute the files, but they need the hardware before they can contribute the files. So it's kind of, this is the embryonic point of the project. It's exciting, super exciting. Yeah? Any other questions? Yeah, Argyle CMS, for people that don't know much about the color, like the under, under stuff, Argyle CMS is kind of like a set of tools which is used for, um, I guess, communicating with the device and actually creating a profile. And although I think personally they're quite clunky, um, I think they work the best we've got. <coughs> no other tools can create better profiles than Argyle CMS and Linux. So although it's a case of, I'm not so happy with the way they work because there's not a shared library that I can use and this kind of stuff. I kind of think it's kind of the best we've got. Does that answer the question? Yeah? What with our, our Gulf CMS? 
I don't have any special concerns because the, the device, the color hub itself, does most of the calculations inside the device itself. So the upshot of our most driver for the color hub is tiny because all it really does is say, I'm profiling a LCD screen, uh, use the default profile for LCD screens. Uh, so use the default CCMX loader for, CC, for LCD screens, give me the XYZ value. So the actual, the actual Argyle CMS drive is tiny, so I don't really think it needs to be improved that much. Um, am I? Sure, yeah, Argyle CMS also has a feature where you can use like a, a, a reference card and then calibrate a scanner or a camera against that. And it works really well as long as you sort of crop the card to the exact, so it's not rotated and so it's only the thing in the, in the, in the picture. But it's not terrifically useful if someone's holding the card and you're just trying to make it do the right thing. So, yeah, our guy the best we've got. I'd love to improve some of the bits in it and maybe split up. A shared library would be great, for instance, because um, then we could actually integrate things in process rather than just screen scrape stuff. Um, so yeah, it's kind of it's, it's it's the best we've got so far, and it's kind of super super hard color maths that I don't understand, so I can't really get too involved. Is that yeah? for it. I think you're right. I was very naive at first because I looked at this thing and I thought, well, there's like $8 worth of parts. But actually, when you work out the R&D, the time, the plastics, the molds, all the different things you have to think about, I still think they're producing the Huey, for instance, at about a two-third profit margin. Because if you're making like 500,000 or 200,000 or something, you get it cheap. A mold works out very, very cheap when you're doing 200,000 units. So although I do think they probably have quite high costs associated with returns and support, I still think it's a massive profit there. If I, if I could make color hugs, if I could make, I don't know, 20,000 color hugs, I could sell them at half the price I am now. You know, it's, it's that much difference. Does that answer the question? One last question, are we done? Superb, thank you. <laughs> oh, I just to say one more thing. We, we, I don't actually have any color hugs with me, so don't start throwing cash at me. Um, I, I did also wanted people, there's like a waiting list as well. The waiting list is like, people have been waiting for weeks and weeks, so I don't really want to let people jump the queue. If you are interested, go to hewski.com. There's a link on how to sort of send me an email with a magic title, which gets you put on the waiting list. And hopefully I can clear the waiting list in the next few weeks. So if you're interested, see the website. Thanks very much. Cheers.